This is Chairwoman Jane Lichter. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, December 20th, 2022. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Ra Hassan. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in person and virtually and broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS.TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the December 20th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I would like to move that information item number two, the map data report, fall 2022, be added as item J, which would relabel first quarter results as item K and information as item L. Is there a, wait a second, is there any, is there, okay, wait a second, I'm just skipping ahead. Is there any discussion? Yes. Is there a second? Second, Pumphrey. Okay, is there any discussion? Mrs. Hassan? I just had a brief clarifying question. Um, so the MAP data report, there is no staff report for that. It's just the report for our information, correct? So at this time, it is for information. OK. Yes. So then we wouldn't have anything to present to therefore create an additional agenda item for it. No, so we, we normally would have a report with some type of presentation in addition mm -hmm. to an information item or executive summary. So we don't have a presentation. We can entertain any questions or comments from board members and we can always follow, follow up. Thank you. Mr. Manowski, can you put the motion into the chat? I am right now. Thank you. Any other? Discussion? I'd like to speak on my motion. Okay. Um, so this map report shows that of the 139 elementary and middle schools listed in Appendix D, 110 schools showed a year-over-year -year decline in the percent of students scoring at or above the 61 percentile in reading. During that same time frame, an abbreviated um, MCAP MCAP showed that only 25% of BCPS third graders were able to demonstrate proficiency in ELA. Page two shows that all BCPS elementary students, with the exception of grade one math, lag behind national peers in ELA and math, as did all BCPS middle school grades. Board members should have the opportunity to ask questions and receive more information about student performance. Is there any other discussion? So I would just like to respond to that. that we provided the map as a benchmark, as a, a data point to know how our students are doing. And then we use that when we do an additional assessment and we use this upcoming state assessment as well as curriculum based assessments to determine how our students are doing. Um, right now, we do not have the individual map results for 2020. Um, the state released the aggregate in terms of how the state is doing. We're waiting to get the individual reports for every school um, so we can then do a clear analysis about how our students are progressing. We do recognize during that time period that there was some learning loss with our students. Um, but again, we're happy to entertain any questions as we get data reports. Um, and clearly, 
we see um, some growth and some decline based on the map, but remember we use that as, as a tool to then inf inform our instruction in every school. And last year we did a presentation regarding um, one particular school and how they utilize the map results to inform instruction to, to work with their staff and students to improve. So again, um, this is information. We're happy to continue to explore and answer additional questions. But I want to say that the 2022 MCAP per school for the schools have not been released yet. The state did a presentation, um, the aggregate, and not for each system. I did just ask a question. Were you talking MAP or MCAP? Well, Ms. Dominowski referenced MCAP, so I referenced about the MCAP oh, as okay. well but for last year's administration. Um, so I just wanted to, to elevate that. Um, we have not received the official data report from MSDE yet. Okay, Ms. Demonowski. Yeah, I, I just wanted to reiterate that. I was just um, referencing that, but I wanted to ask questions because we do have actual data from Baltimore County Schools in the map. So that's yeah. what I would like to ask questions about. Sure, this is the map, the map, right. the map. not the MCAP. I just okay. wanted to clarify. Okay, um, Ms. Hag Dr. Hager. Um, I just wanted to say that I would support this motion just because we are already talking about attendance in the MCAP and since it's available in information, it seems like a logical extension of that discussion and the MAP testing is a nationally representative test versus the MCAP, which is a Maryland specific test. So um, again, it, it seems like a, a logical extension of our discussion we're already going to have. So I would support this motion. Thank you. Any other discussion? May I have a roll call, please? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mrs. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. His favor is nine. So the motion passes. So the motion, can I reread the motion? Yes. Right. So the motion is to move information item number two, map data report, fall 2022, to be added as item J, which would relabel first quarter results as item K and information as item L. And that was just moved, so I will figure out those letters as we go through the agenda. Okay. Dr. Williams, did you have any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Okay. Okay. Summary of closed session. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The summary of the closed session and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this meeting, under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personal matters and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D4? So moved, Hassan. Do I have a second? Second, Dominowski. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favors nine. 
Motion carries. Dr. Williams. Yes. Madam Chair <coughs> Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, and members of the board, I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Manager, Office of Purchasing. Supervisor, Secondary English, Office of English Language Arts. Pupil Personnel Worker, there are two positions, Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming, and Supervisor in the Office of Health Services. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So move, Pumphrey. Do I have a second? Second, Hassan. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Favors nine. Motion carries. Dr. Williams? Yes. So our first appointment is Robert Bertazone as the manager of purchasing in the Office of Purchasing. He is new to Baltimore County Public Schools. He is attending. I ask that he stand at this time. There he is. <clears throat> he brings to us uh, uh, several experiences. He was the founder of Maryland Construction Network, LLC, for over nine years. He's been the executive director, Masonry Institute of Maryland, and the American Subcontracts Association of Baltimore Incorporated Executive Director of Electric Lead of Maryland. He is new to Baltimore County once again, so welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. <laughs> Next, we have Jonathan Gonzalez as the Supervisor, Secondary English of the Office of English Language Arts. Please stand. Attending tonight is his wife. Attending tonight is his wife, Jennifer Gonzalez, and a little special joy in his hand. <laughs> so welcome back to Baltimore County uh, Balt uh, Public Schools. Previously, he served as the assessment specialist for K-12 English Language Arts and Literacy in the Maryland State Department of Education. And prior to that, he served as a resource teacher in the Office of Secondary Language English Teacher at Parkville Middle and Parkville High. So welcome back once again to Baltimore County Public Schools. Next, we have Jasma T. John as a pupil personnel worker in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive Programming. <laughs> Attending with her tonight is her mom, Miss Liz Best. Please stand. Jasmine John brings to us over four years of experience in Baltimore County. Previously, she served as a psychologist in the Office of Psychological Services, and she's had prior experience in Charles County Public Schools, the DC uh, District of Columbia Public Schools, as well as Prince George's County. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Robert A. Mail as the supervisor in the Office of Health Services. He brings to Attending tonight is his spouse, Mike I L D and Drug G. I apologize if I messed that up. Um, welcome back. He's one of our rehired retirees. He's given us over 31 years of experience in Baltimore County. Uh, he served at previously as a school nurse at Hernwood Elementary School in the Office of Health Services at Woodlawn High School, Newtown Elementary, Edmondson Heights Elementary, Pine Grove Middle, Stimmers Run Middle. Congratulations. <laughs> Next we have Iman, Iman F. Muller, a pupil personnel worker in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services and Responsive <laughs> Student Program. Attending with him is his wife, Michelle Muller. Please stand. <laughs> he brings over three years of experience in Baltimore County. Previously, he served as the school counselor at Sparrows Point High School. Congratulations. <laughs> that concludes Thank the appointment. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and congratulations to everyone.
Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. Persons using, using language that is threatening or promotes violence against a BCPS employee are subject to legal penalties. Persons who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of the, your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the public. I will now call on our advisory and stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Leslie Weber from the PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairperson Lichter, Vice Chairperson Harvey, Board of Education members, and Dr. Williams. I'm Leslie Weber, President of the PTA Council of Baltimore County. We support and train all the PTA and PTSA units in Baltimore County Public Schools. Congratulations on your election as board leaders, Ms. Lichter and Ms. Harvey, and congratulations to the other members who were recently elected. PTA Council is excited to partner with you to strengthen our schools. Thank you to the appointed members for continuing to serve until our new governor appoints your successors. As I reported the last time I spoke here in November, we continue working hard to restart many units. We promise to get data on the status of units to Dr. Williams, Dr. Yarbrough, and Ms. Charlie Green as soon as we're able. The last time I spoke, I introduced new council board members. I'd like to add that we're thrilled that the BCP BCPS Office of Family and Community Engagement helped us find new Baltimore County Student Council's liaison to Yossi Dada, a junior at Towson High School. It's crucial to have student voice on our board. We'd like to invite everyone to our next general meeting and workshops on Thursday, January 26th at 7 p.m. at Lock Raven High School. We're hoping to make it a hybrid event. After a brief, brief business meeting, We'll have presentations from the Free State PTA Membership Chair and from the BCPS Office of Facilities Operations to talk about using the BCPS Event Manager and related insurance requirements. PTAs have asked for this training. Our Family, School, and Community Partnerships Committee Chair, Ramona Basilio, spoke for PTA Council at your last meeting. I want to commend her for her commitment to increasing PTA Council's outreach. We're excited about our new partnership with BCPS and the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council to better engage multilingual, multilingual students and their families. You'll hear more about this soon. Our focus on family engagement is extending to our PTA Council Annual Awards Program, which will be streamlined and revamped to recognize units hosting innovative family engagement programs or establishing partnerships that bring com the community into their schools. We're also streamlining the process for BCPS seniors to apply for our annual scholarships. Information on our awards and scholarships will be posted on our website next month. 
thank you to everyone and happy holidays. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gita Henoa from the Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, it's a student in a public, Baltimore County Public Schools, and I am sorry if I did not pronounce your name, Ron. <laughs> How do you pronounce your name? Gita Hanawi. Okay. Good evening. Um, I'm Gita Hanawi, and I'm a senior at Delaney High School, and I help run the Club Girl Up. Um, and I'm here to talk about the new legislation that was just passed by the Maryland General Assembly, the Menstrual Equity Policy, or HB 205 and SB 427. This legislation states that by October 1st, 2022, public schools must provide menstrual hygiene products via dispensers in at least two high school and two middle school bathrooms and one elementary school bathroom at no cost to students. This law was a huge step in combating period poverty or the inability to access menstrual products. However, it has not been enforced yet as Delaney is one of several schools in our community that have dispensers installed, yet they have lagged products throughout the entire year. Um, aside from providing training and tools for fe female empowerment in our community, our Club Girl Up has also taken initiative by distributing menstrual products in all six restrooms at our school. We place at least 15 bathrooms in each, we place each, at least 15 products in each of our bathrooms every or other, every other Friday, depending on how much we have, and that supply is gone by the following Wednesday. At this moment, the products are being stocked up through donations from our school community and club funds that we have raised to cover these costs. Through our own distribution, it's very evident that there is a demand for these products and it has helped many at our school. That being said, I'm here speaking with you in hopes of continuing our fight against period poverty together and to continue to support students in Baltimore County. Our club as a goal is to utilize our position and resources um, in our community to support local women's shelters and organizations, but we cannot complete our mission when students at school also lack support. Therefore, we're asking the board to install dispensers in the public bathrooms and more importantly, maintain the replenishment of these products. With the proper allocation and distribution of menstrual hygiene products following the Maryland General Assembly's bill, many students will gain access to basic hygiene necessities that can improve their student experience and their well-being. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Donna Sibley from the Area Education Advisory Council. She's the coordinator of the Area Education Advisory Councils. Good evening, Chair um, Lecter and Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Mel excuse me, Dr. Williams, and board members. Uh, I bring you greetings from all of the advisory councils, and I am Donna Sibley, the coordinator of the five area education advisory councils. I want to congratulate all of those that are newly elected to the board, and I also would like to thank those that are appointed that have agreed to continue their service until the new appointees are appointed by the governor. Uh, this evening, I would like to take just a few minutes to give you a little overview of the advisory councils. Bo uh, policy 1230 is the policy that actually dictates what the, pol what the advisory councils do. It was uh, adopted by the board April 22nd, 1976. So advisory councils have been around a good while. In the um, policy statement, it reads, the Board of Education of Baltimore County believes that the Area Education Advisory Councils, or AEACs for short, exist to improve the quality of education in Baltimore County and to strengthen the relationship between the school system and the community by serving as informed advisors to the board on public school issues and promoting interest and involvement in the school system. The board establishes the AEACs as standing committees which report directly to the board. With careful attention to the input from the community, the AEACs are charged with advising the board on issues that affect students, families, communities, and schools. The policy also states that the members of the councils are appointed by the board and the membership is limited to 15 in each council. Two of these individuals can be students in 11th or 12th grade, and I think many times we forget that the students really are stakeholders too. And in my opinion, they're the most important stakeholders within the county. And uh, we have had wonderful students this year 
So if you know of any 11th or 12th graders that we welcome them and would hope that they would become students also. Uh, we are looking, excuse me, we are looking forward to working with the new board this year. Uh, we wish you happy holidays, whichever holidays you celebrate, and thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Marietta English from the NAACP of Baltimore County. Good evening, President Lecter and Vice President Harvey and uh, school board members and Superintendent Dr. Williams. Congratulations on your election. Um, some of you, I had the signs in my yard. So thank you very much. My name is Mary English, and I am the chair of the AXO program for the Baltimore County branch of the NAACP. Some of you have heard about this, but those of you who are new, I would like to bring your attention to our AXO program. AXO stands for Afro-American Academic Scientific Olympics. It was founded for young people to be recognized for academic, scientific, and artistic achievement, allowing young people to be recognized equal to those of athletes and entertainers. There are 26 categories that the students in grades 9 through 12 can compete, from sciences, performing arts, humanities, and culinary arts. They compete locally, and the gold medal winners go on to compete nationally for awards gold, silver, or bronze. We are very fortunate this year, one of our gold medal winners in the humanities was offered a complete and full scholarship to Coppin State University. And she's only in the 10th grade this year. So she was in the ninth grade when she won. She was also interviewed for an article in the Sun paper. So Baltimore County has great students and we're doing great things. The AXO program is an enrichment program. Over the year, the students work with mentors and teachers to develop projects and participate in enrichment opportunities. We are proud of our partnership with Baltimore County Public Schools. They are providing many opportunities for our students to participate and develop. Just recently, some of our students attended the HBCU College Fair and talked about the value of attending the fair and how valuable the information was for them in making decisions about attending the universities or college that they plan to attend. We look forward to attending many other activities such as this. Our competition this year will be held in April, and I look forward to coming back and sharing much more information with you and our, and our winners. Happy holidays and Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Billy Burke from Case. Hello. Hi. Good evening, Chairwoman Mrs. Lichter, Vice Chair Mrs. Harvey, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I would like to say congratulations and welcome to the new members of the board. I would also like to thank you, to say thank you to the returning members of the board. Case is grateful for your commitment to the students, families, community, and staff of BCPS. You have a tough job ahead. There are no magic bullets. Decisions will be complicated. Some decisions will appear to benefit some students and alienate stakeholders. Other decisions around race, poverty, and equity will ask you to contemplate how to level the playing field so all children will have access to an appropriate education. It is through those tough decisions, though, that you will better the lives of the children in our community. As introduced, my name is Billy Burke, and I am the Executive Director of CASE. CASE stands for the Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees. In layman's terms, I am the head of the bargaining unit, or union, that represents principals, assistant principals, and central office supervisors. I worked for BCPS for 28 years as a teacher, school administrator, and in the central office, spending most of my career working on leadership development and equity. I finished my career on the superintendent's staff as a chief in 2020. 
I'd like to take a minute and introduce to the new board members CASE's priorities for this school year. The first priority is to advocate for fair and reasonable workload and compensation. The second priority is to advocate for short-term and long-term plans for addressing the staffing crisis. The third priority is to advocate for appropriate special education staffing. And the fourth and final priority this year is to advocate for changes to the negotiation and budget development processes. I would like the opportunity to meet virtually or in person with each of you to clarify Case's position on the many issues you will contemplate. I hope my years of experience and my connection to school and central office leadership can support you in your decision making. Thank you again for taking on this challenging, sometimes thankless, but always important and rewarding work. BCPS will be better because of you. Wishing you all a restful and peaceful holiday season. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of CASE. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marlena Purcell from the Southwest Area Educational Advisory Council. She's the chair, actually, of the Southwest Council. Finishing the holes. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Marlena Col Colleton Purcell, and I am the chair of the Southwest Education Advisory Council. Good evening, um, Madam Chair. So excited. <laughs> and Vice Chair Harvey. Um, Dr. Williams, good evening. To all who are here, happy holidays. We thank each and every one of you for the um, dedication that you have shown and the commitment. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to highlight at our last meeting, which was held um, via Zoom, December 12, 2022, we discussed three questions. And I filed the playbook of Dr. Williams. The first question, what would you say that Baltimore County Public School does well and what what would you like to continue? I'm going to highlight one answer of the many, and that was communication. Um, one of the parents indicated that, and actually a parent and employee indicated that the communication um, seems to be um, more of and abundant, and she really appreciates that. And I know as a parent, I appreciate the Schoology notices and the um, information that comes out um, by email. The second question was, what would you like to see Baltimore County Public Schools do better or eliminate altogether? The irony is communication. <laughs> so let me explain. This one was more so as a direct to the Southwest area. Um, there are a lot of um, non-speaking English students and parents' households. And so one of the things that they were indicating that we need to do better is to make sure that we have translators, um, even at our meetings perhaps, or even as a, a flyer that goes out, making sure that those schools that have a heavy population in a certain particular um, non um, English language has it translated to meet their needs. So not just Spanish, but whatever the language is in that school. And then the third question was, what new things would you like to see in Baltimore County Public Schools at your child's schools? Pause. I won't go into all of those because it says your child's school, right? But I will provide the board members here the information. And thank you for attending, um, Chair Lickner. You're welcome. Our meetings are on Zoom the second Mondays. And I just want to invite each and every one of you, if you do not receive notices in your child's um, book bag, make sure you go onto the Baltimore County website, type in AEAC meetings, and then therefore you will find any other area and you can attend. Um, please do not let transportation be the issue because we are on Zoom and let not the topic be the issue because you can attend any of the area meetings. I thank you for your time, happy holidays, and best wishes all. Thank you very much. And our last stakeholder group speaker is Dr. Lashana Stitt, who is the Northwest Area Advisory Council chairperson. So after they hug, then yes. <laughs> Dr. Stitt will Thank you. provide Thank you comments. Everyone. Thank you. Good evening. Greetings, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and present board members. 
As stated earlier, my name is Dr. LaShawn Stitt, and as the chairperson of the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council, I represent the scholars, families, and stakeholders in the Northwest region of the county while serving as the liaison between the board and the community. Let me begin by acknowledging the land on which we stand, territory that was originally inhabited by the Susquehanna people. I stand in acknowledgement with other indigenous black, brown, and ethnically diverse individuals of this county and our expression of gratitude and appreciation to them. And I ask that you join me in honoring them as well. Now, to highlight the purpose of my appearance this evening, Many of the stakeholders in the Northwest region have expressed a concern with the growing number of issues affecting our young people and the call to action that needs to take place in our district. From sinking scores on high stakes assessments to poor relationships with scholars and families to the overlooking of funds that are desperately needed in the most vulnerable spaces. We need to see the commitment to excellence for all children in the county, particularly those who are historically marginalized and disenfranchised. We implore this board to utilize all resources and practices available to bring forth change in our future leaders of the state, country, and world. Since September, our council has hosted a number of meetings where families, educators, district leaders, elected officials, and community stakeholders were invited to attend. We realize that the landscape of BCPS is changing and it is our duty to meet the needs of all stakeholders, no matter the ethnicity, culture, religious belief, identity choice, physical or mental ability, or socioeconomic status. We implore this board to also keep that in mind when making decisions about curriculum, teacher recruitment and retention, family engagement, and funding for programs that acknowledge, value, and invest in the excellence that has been stifled for so many years. Our stakeholders deserve full transparency when it comes to the widening gap between black, brown, and marginalized students and their white counterparts. Our community is entitled to know why so many of our traditionally underserved scholars are not placed in more rigorous courses and why so many have lost faith not only in the system of education, but in the adults of Baltimore County who have failed to meet their needs academically, emotionally, socially, and culturally. We would like for this board to initiate a change, a change in the equity practices and actions that will demonstrate a move towards inclusion, opportunity, and equity. I will end here, but we do ask that all board members commit to the equity training offered through Mr. Doug Handy's office and that our teachers engage in the same trainings to address biases that exist. Thank you, happy holidays. I appreciate your presence and I look forward to a new year of accountability, responsibility, and action for all scholars of BCPS. Thank you, Dr. Stitt. And thank you to all our stakeholders. Next, that spoke. Next is public comment, on, is general public comment, and our first speaker is Amy Adams. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter. Good evening, Vice Chair Harvey and members of the board. I see that the proposed 24 county capital budget is on the agenda for tonight, and I would like to request an update for number 13 on the priority list, Delaney High School. It shows that the state approved zero dollars as of October 17, 2022, of the 113 million request. On November 22nd, the county executive wrote a letter to the acting executive director of the IAC urging BCPS to promptly submit documentation requested by the IAC so full state funding can be realized and there's no unnecessary delays in the replacement project. My question for you is has BCPS sent the appropriate documentation to the IAC and if not what is the status? On the agenda for this evening is the report on forced first quarter results. The presentation was not attached to board docs prior to the meeting, so I'm not exactly sure what will be discussed. Um, 
attached as information was the map data fall report. Thank you to the board members for adding that to the agenda tonight for discussion. The data in this report comparing fall of 2021 map scores to fall of 2022 map scores is extremely concerning. But to be honest, this isn't surprising. We have been on an academic decline for almost a decade according to multiple data points and assessments. Just focusing on the reading portion of the map data, the percentage of students scoring at or above the 61st percentile in reading decreased from 2021 to 2022 across all elementary grade levels. We all know that students learn to read in grades kindergarten through third and read to learn in third grade and higher. The fact that students who scored at or above the 61st percentile ranges from 36 to 43 percent is a huge red flag. First, I find the 61st percentile very low bar, and the fact that less than half of our elementary students are meeting that benchmark, despite having early screenings and targeted interventions in place, must leave room to do something drastically different. Not only are we not closing gaps between student groups, we have, are having less kids meet proficiency rates. Staff has stated before as a reason to justify purchasing new curriculum that only one third of BCPS students are reading on grade level. How does any of this add up to preparing children for college or career? If a child cannot read adequately, they cannot possibly be expected to thrive in other subjects like math, science, social studies, etc. Somewhere there is a breakdown. Is it the quality of curriculum? Is it the amount of training and support? Is it the, the implementation to fidelity? We cannot continue to spend millions of dollars with no accountability. Who is the person ultimately in charge of these outcomes? Accountability requires leadership. True leaders take responsibility for outcomes. Who is our leader in this situation? What is the plan to chase, change this course starting immediately? That's all I have time for. So I hope you all have a good break and happy holidays and thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Serhoff. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our new members, and welcome back to those of you who have been here for a while. I hope that you will get used to me in a positive manner when I talk about special ed and how to improve the delivery of services. What I'd like to talk about tonight, though, is college and career readiness. That is something that the state has tasked every school system with in the state, and I think that Baltimore County right now is falling short from what I have seen from my students, which are those with disabilities. What is college and career readiness? It is not providing the bare minimum so that a child gets their credits and walks across the stage. That's what I have seen from some of the high schools. Because we are not requiring all the high schools to, be, to grade on the same policy because we are not requiring all the high schools to do the same standard. Each high school is doing basically their own thing. And I know that we'd like to believe otherwise, but I have students who are not being afforded magnet programs. They are being discouraged from getting into a magnet school. I have students who are not getting internships because their school isn't giving them the information in a timely manner, saying that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to not give it to you last year. You're not required to get that internship, but that internship is important. I was in a meeting today where we were told that the child is getting the bare minimum and they're modifying that minimum so that the child can pass the class and walk across the stage with their class in spite of the fact that the parent and the student said they don't want that. 
We need to take a better look at what college and career readiness means for our students with disabilities and make sure that parents and advocates and students are part of that conversation. And if somebody says, I'm not ready, we need to listen, not brush them aside. Have a happy holiday. Thank you. Our next speaker is Derek Burnett. Good evening, board members. Good evening, board president. Good evening, superintendent of schools, Dr. Darrell L. Williams. First and foremost, it's a privilege and pleasure to present to you this evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome all your new board members, and especially, do we have the student representative here today? Especially the new student representative. <laughs> Secondly, I'd like to thank the Office of School Counseling for the superior execution of the HBCU College Fair that was held in Newtown on December the 10th. It was an excellent activity which attracted over 1,900 students and 30 of the 105 HBCUs in the country. In addition to the HBCUs, it also attracted nine, all nine of the Greek letter organizations uh, within the country itself. These Greek letter organizations are community-driven, community-oriented, community-active organizations that interact with millions of people throughout the country and hundreds of millions of people throughout the world. Prime example, we have uh, Vice President, uh, the Honorable Kamala Harris is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Uh, she's also a HBCU graduate. Additionally, we have uh, the former congressman, Mr. John Lewis, HBCU graduate of Fisk University, and also a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. We have Mr. Elijah Cummings, Howard University graduate, and also a, a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. As you can see, HBCU graduates have had a great influence on my life. But let me talk to you about some local educators that have touched my life and thousands of others. You have Mr. Joseph Wolfolk, who was formerly a Fulbright Scholar and member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity and also a graduate of Morgan State University. You had Dr. Walter Ampre, Baltimore City School Superintendent, graduate of Morgan State University and member of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity. You had former Dr. Former president of UMBC, Dr. Freeman Habrowski, Hampton Institute grad, who graduated at the age of 16, a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. So as you can see, uh, HBCUs and Divine Nine organizations have a great influence on our community, and they continue to have a great influence on our nation and, and additionally our world. So continue to have this fair. I look forward to participating in it next year and many years to come. And, and thank you, Daryl Williams, for all that you do as a member of Kappa Alpha Psi. Thank you. Our next speaker is Muhammad Jamil. Good evening. Good evening. Peace and blessings to everyone. Uh, I have represented the community, especially the children of Muslim parents, since 1984. 
I've had the privilege to serve as a PTA president, board member of Baltimore County Muslim Council, president of the largest Islamic institution in the Mid-Atlantic Coast with a membership of over 20,000 families, and a commissioner in one of the Baltimore County commissions for at least nine years. It's nearly 200th time that I'm appearing before the board today. History is a branch of knowledge that records and explains the past. Therefore, while I welcome the new board members and thank them for their thankless service, it's important for them to know about the 33 years struggle with the BCPS to treat the Muslim students equally regarding closings of the schools on their two high holidays. For your information, the mother of my children is a Roman Catholic. Children are keen observers. They know when a policy or an action is unfair, discriminatory, or unjust. My three children were in the BCPS from 1976 through 1995. Their experience had been no different than every Muslim student. Many children gave testimonials to this board about their challenges and difficulties, if not their suffering, due to absence on their high holidays. Unlike their peers, who could have a perfect attendance record, not having to make up lost lessons and homework, able to participate in school sports and family gatherings, etc. They felt marginalized, alienated, isolated, and discriminated. They were devastated by the decision of the superintendent, Dr. Stuart Berger, in 1998, when he rejected only Muslim holidays, despite the recommendation of the calendar committee to rectify the inequality. Ms. Barbara Desmond from the Maryland State Board of Education had also testified and advised the board not to shut the door already opened to non-Komar holidays for one minority. It was 2017 when the board did find a way to eliminate the inequality and discriminatory policy of making exception for only one minority. I've observed the hard work of the calendar committee. They have to juggle many factors to come up with calendar year after year. Lately, the two holidays have become the easy way out to put them on the chopping block. It's very distressing. There is room in adjusting spring, summer, and winter breaks to achieve and maintain the equality of Muslim students instead of rescinding the 2017 decision. Thank you for listening and wish you all a safe, prosperous, healthy holidays and new year and every day in the new year. Thank you, God bless you all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm Lloyd Allen, he, him, special educator in mathematics, speaking as an individual. I'll be brief tonight. This is the time of year when we consider renewal. Earlier this month, you renewed yourselves as a board with the elected members being sworn in. Last weekend, educators received their request for declarations of intent, renewal notices, as it were. Tomorrow marks the winter solstice and our sun begins its journey back to us, lengthening the days and shortening the nights so that our non-transported high school students will have morning commutes with natural light. Next month, you will receive the proposed operating budget from the superintendent. You will hear public comment from stakeholders and you will have a work session at the end of the month. As you review the operating budget line by line, when you notice significant costs from outsourcing items that are part of our core mission before renewing, please consider, does the contract in this line serve the students? Is the contract in this line something that another profession specializes in, or is it something that we should be doing as it is part of our core mission? Does the contract in this line further the public good, or does it have significant and expensive overhead associated? Partnering with CCBC does further the public good and the mission of public education. Opportunities similar to that should certainly be pursued, especially when they cover gaps in our offerings such as ASL. And I totally get that we can't write gradebook software as a school system. 
However, in the long term, folding contracts that don't meet these tests back under our own wing will serve us better than abrogating our responsibilities. Outsourcing subs is a significant expense. And since this year, BCPS doesn't directly compensate or oversee our subs, BCPS doesn't have direct control over resolving their issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of our speakers. Next is public comment on board policies. So speaking first for board policy 1300, use of school facilities is Jida Henawa. Oh, I think I did it again. Nope. Okay. Next, speaking on use of school facilities is Marlena Purcell. Okay. Next is Sharon Serhoff. I'm going to speak from the, uh, I'm going to speak from the uh, perspective of someone who has used the facilities and unfortunately has been unable to use the facilities um, since the pandemic, since actually before the pandemic. I'm on the board of a local theater group called Open Space Arts which is based in Reisterstown. And we have in the past um, requested use and have had use um, of facilities for, um, for our plays and for rehearsal. And we have not been able to procure that recently. I've also, am a member of the Society for Creative Anachronism, which I know very, very, early on in my, in my living here in Maryland, which is about 20 years ago that this happened, we used Franklin Middle School as the site for holding our meetings. Um, getting to use the facilities in Baltimore County right now, even trying to go through the uh, parks and recreation, um, has been an impossibility. We don't hear back from people um, and when we do hear back from people, um, the process is not well explained, if it's explained at all. Um, what I think needs to happen in this policy, if you're going to make some changes, is, make, is work with the Parks and Recreation to make that process uh, more streamlined, more understandable, and community friendly. Um, the community would like to be more involved in your school system and making your facilities more community friendly and more open would be very helpful. That's what I have to say about that. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Derek Burnett. Lloyd Allen. Good evening. Good evening. I'm continuing to speak as an individual. Considering policy analysis 1300, I'm concerned about page three, lines four and five. At the October meeting, the board considered including language that requires a security check of the facility before, during, and after each use. The break from page three to four, page four notes that the estimated cost of a single security check would likely exceed $200 per use. I don't recall seeing anything about the length of time that an adequate security check would take. School buildings are community resources. We are a public school system serving the public good. We cannot be and should not be hardened. Bruce Schneier is a security expert. In 2005, he wrote a column for Wired Magazine cautioning us against attempting to defend against specific movie plots rather than broad threats. We imagine specific threats and we attempt to defend against them. When I did athletic duty earlier this year, a staff member from another work site wanted to grade in the stands while watching their athlete. They brought their bag with their grading. 
I had to tell them to return their bag to the car. This caused ill will. This did not create safety. If you see something, say something, sure. I'm not saying to ignore security concerns. However, please focus on being welcoming community members. Focus on providing social emotional supports for today's students who are both today's and tomorrow's citizens to find solutions other than aggression. Demonstrate that we value our students, staff, and community members. Facilitate positive connections between groups and individuals. Community members using school buildings are not outsiders. We are part of the community. As we pursue community schools with fidelity, we are the hub of the community. We need to embrace that and not set policies that may give the impression that we think ourselves separate from the community that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking on policy, board policy 3410, transportation services, is Sharon Seroff. I'm going to speak very, very specifically on something that is near and dear to my heart, which is special education and special transportation. Um, we don't do a good job with that at all. Um, I have had students who don't get a bus coming down their street when they need door-to-door -door transportation. And I'll give you an example. I have a client who is in a wheelchair and he's not getting door-to-door -door transportation. He's getting it that he has to walk a block. That shouldn't be the case. Special transportation is provided on an IEP, which is a legal document. Most of your IEP chairs understand that special transportation means door to door, and that is not the case. When a child has to walk a block and they're in a wheelchair, or they're a flight risk because they elope from a parent or they have a behavior concern. Simply saying to a parent, well, my bus can't get down your street when the garbage truck gets down the street, the UPS truck gets down the street, is not an excuse for not providing the transportation as it should be. And that's a policy, that's something that should be in your policy so that it's understood and followed and not that I have students who aren't getting transportation to school to get the instruction and services that they need and are required to get by law. The second thing that I think I need for you guys to understand is that there isn't enough transportation for students to magnet programs. I know students that are not getting a bus in the morning because there's only one bus available and they are crammed into that bus and sitting in the aisle or standing in the aisle, which is not safe and I don't care what anybody says that it's okay, it's not safe. And they have two buses in the afternoon so they can go home in the afternoon. How are they supposed to get to the, to the building? You need to have enough buses to transport kids both to the school and from the school. And not have students sitting three and four to a seat or sitting in the aisle. That's a safety concern. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Number one, board policy 1300, community relations, use of school facilities. Number two, board policy 3410, non-instructional services, transportation services. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit G. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board Policy Review Committee for Board Policies 1300 and 3410? So moved, Hassan. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? 
Mrs. San? I just I just okay. had a clarifying question. So for policy um, 3410C3, um, when it discusses that a student is enrolled in an authorized Baltimore County Public Schools educational program, that includes our magnet schools, correct? So is there somebody from policy and review committee that can speak to that? Oh, okay. Can you put your question in the chat? Or sure, yeah. And I just wanted to clarify the wording, but Ms. Harvey, do you have a question too? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to know the impetus for changing the distance required in policy thirty four ten for middle school and high school students. I'll put it in the chat as well. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Um, okay. Nope. So I just. I'm going, I'm going to ask Dr. Yeah. Yarbrough to uh, respond to those questions regarding transportation at this time. Dr. Yarbrough. Do you want, yes, Dr. Yarbrough, you want to respond? Absolutely. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Chair Lichter, uh, Vice Chair Harvey, uh, members of the board. I want to respond to your question. First, Ms. Hassan, you spoke about whether or not magnet schools and transportation are a part of our policy. They absolutely are, for magnet schools in particular both in the application process as well as in our policy. It states that we have hub stops. And so, you know, that's the transportation that we provide at all three levels, elementary school programs, middle school, and high school. Um, in reference to uh, the question, Vice Chair Harvey, about the extending the distance, last year um, we spent a great amount of time looking at our services looking how to innovate looking at both short-term solutions as well as long-term solutions one of the uh, long-term solutions that we looked at with all of the stakeholder groups was extending our uh, non-transported distance in middle school and high school we provided all of the data for all of the leas across the state of maryland particularly for our middle schools, we were much shorter distance. I think we we're at one mile. And then for high schools, we were much shorter distance with all of the larger um, school systems. So we proposed moving up a quarter of a mile, looking at the impact on uh, long term in terms of improving efficiency. And so that's where that came from. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, Mr. McMillian? Did we utilize an outside consultant to evaluate our transportation? And if so, did they make this recommendation? We did utilize an outside consultant. We actually have uh, two members on board. This was one of the uh, recommendations that came out when we shared all of the recommendations for improved um, efficiency. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? One more. Um, Ms. Mumphrey, and then back to Ms. Harvey. When you speak about other larger school systems that have similar distances, um, were these, do you know if these were recent changes in those school systems or if that's been a longstanding um, policy for the distance being longer than what we have currently here? Uh, I, that's something I would have to look into. Ms. Harvey? Uh, just a, a clarification. The goal to improve efficiencies, can you speak to specifically what areas of efficiency you're looking to improve? Is that timeliness of service? Is it number of students being transported? Is it meeting the needs of our special education students? Can you provide some detail on that? Yes, so when we were looking at improving efficiency of service, uh, specifically last year we were looking for timeliness of service. We were looking for improved communication so that students and families knew when to expect 
uh, the buses, and we are looking for improvements in terms of safety overall on buses and responses to any safety concerns that existed, particularly amongst students um, as they were on the board, on board the buses. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. You said there were parents on the committee when this was being generated? Yes, there is a long list of uh, different stakeholder groups that we met with last year, um, including the reopening stakeholder group, uh, went out to every area council, the council of PTAs, and, and the list goes on. Yes, parents were absolutely a part of this. Okay, and they were in support of the changes. Any other questions? May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. <clears throat> Humphrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Favors? Nine. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call Mr. Mercedes. Good evening. Good evening. As you know, earlier tonight the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to render decisions in two cases. Those were HE 23-03 and HE 23-14. Now would be an appropriate time to confirm the action taken in closed session. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner cases HE 23-03 and 23-14 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present. So moved, Harvey. Is there a second? Second, the boy, second. Any discussion? <laughs> May I have a roll call vote? Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Pomfrey? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Favor is nine. Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is the report on the proposed FY 2024 county capital budget, and for that I call Mr. Hartlove and Mr. Dixit. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Lichter, Vice Chair Harvey, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. So tonight we are here to introduce the fiscal 24, 2024 county capital budget request in the next meeting uh, on January 10th. Uh, we'll describe in detail the process and content of the request. Attachments that have already been shared they include a schedule, and they schedule, and they include last year's approved state budget and this year's proposed county budget. We are requesting that you review those documents, and if you have any questions, please submit it to Dr. Williams' office by January the 3rd. And uh, we'll try to answer those questions before the work session as soon as we can get the question and uh, get the answers. That's all I have to say tonight. I'll be talking a lot more in the next meeting. And I just wanted to thank you and wish you happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, please provide any questions related to the proposed FY 2024 county capital budget to Dr. Williams by close of business on Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023. The work session for this will be held during the January 10th, 2023 board meeting. The next item on the agenda is the report on first quarter results. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas and Dr. Zarchin. 
Oh, okay, right. Okay, so right, K become J. Oh, I need to refresh, okay, thank you. Give me one second, thanks. All right. Okay, so where are we? Okay, so. Okay, so at this point we've added a map data report and discussion. So are we, are we still bringing the same people to the table for the map data discussion? So we'll begin with Dr. Uh, Dr. The first quarter. Shall I stay? You're fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this was added as a discussion on a map data report that was originally intended as informational. Ms. McComas, did you want to, Dr. McComas, did you want to start or did you want us to just ask questions? Well, I will just go ahead and just do a brief, uh, I guess, level setting, if, if I may, for what MAP is for those of you who may be familiar, and some of you may be familiar, and some of you may be unfamiliar. So MAP is one uh, data measurement. It is a national assessment. Uh, it stands for um, measures of academic performance. Uh, it, engage, it measures that for reading and math at the elementary and middle school grades. Uh, it is um, an adaptive test whereby as students demonstrate greater proficiency, the, it, the test actually gives them more difficult questions. Um, and again, uh, you can see in the report that uh, it is something that we use to compare how we're doing against national norms. Uh, we do give the map at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. So it's important to understand that the report you're looking at is our baseline data for this year. So that's where our students are starting at the beginning of this year. Uh, we do provide comparative data so that you can see where students were beginning uh, last year and where uh, they're beginning relative to the national the norm. So I hope that that um, is a little bit of a level setting. Um, and this is a, an assessment that we use to measure growth. So you can have students who uh, we want to look at both achievement and growth along the trajectory, right? Because you may have students in the biggest picture of assessment. Um, not hitting the proficiency level, right, if you will, like they're not crossing the finish line where we want them to, but are they accelerating? Are they making progress towards that? And so I just ask as we move forward as a community discussing data, whether it's MAP or as Dr. Williams mentioned earlier, our state MCAP assessments, uh, that we're constantly looking at both achievement and growth. Um, because students that are behind, their rate of growth is um, something really important to pay attention to, as it is for our gift and advanced students. It's a, they could be achieving, but are they growing? Are we challenging them? So there are two concepts that I ask that you keep in mind. This particular assessment really focuses in on uh, the growth process for students. So I hope that helps kind of level set. Let me just ask a question. When you so we have the 2022 fall map data that was on the chart in the informational session, correct? Yes. And then the 2021 was that the fall data or was that winter data? That was fall data. Okay. So while it's benchmark, it's also looking at from last fall to this fall. Yes, that's correct. So last year's beginning marks to this year's beginning marks. Okay. Can you just also explain the 61 percentile because there's percentages, percentile, can you just explain that one piece before we go on? Yes, yeah, so the uh, 61st percentile is the um, mark, and while we certainly would love our students to do greater than that, by no means do we want that to be uh, the, the limit of their success, it is the threshold that um, research shows is the, the trajectory to be college and career ready. So that's sort of the, the minimum line that we ultimately want to get all students to, but we certainly want them to do better than as well. Questions from board members? Ms. Demonowski? Yes, um, I, I just wanted to see if uh, there was going to be further um, research or discussion into the discrepancies in um, the um, special education and the EL learners. Um, I feel that their numbers are much lower than even the across 
you know, multicultural races. Um, can you comment on that? Or Yes, absolutely. And thank you for paying such close attention to how our students are doing. It, it is true. We have great work to do for students who receive services for special education and are in multilingual learners as well. Uh, I will just comment that um, special education is something that we are striving to work through. We have plans that we are working hand in hand with MSDE to uh, dig deep into our delivery service model um, and to provide greater professional development across the board. One of the initiatives that we took this year um, using uh, some of the grant money that we currently have uh, was to begin um, piloting, if you will, or um, putting in place elementary IEP facilitators, which is something that our CCAC group, our Citizen Advisory for Special Education, has been advocating for at least, I know, the eight years that I've been with Baltimore County. Uh, and so that's one, just an example of one of the initiatives that we're trying uh, to really get deeper into understanding how to provide greater support at the classroom and the school level. Uh, in terms of our multilingual learners, it is our fastest growing student population. Um, and we know that it is important to understand that when we're talking about our multilingual learners, it is not monolithic. You may have a student who has lived their entire life here in the United States and in the Baltimore area, um, but their home language is other than English. And you may have next to them a student who has who is an immigrant who has come as and lived several years in a refugee camp and has uh, extensive interruption to their formal education, if you will. Uh, we as a system are uh, quite frankly behind in our, our uh, resources to support our multilingual learners. We have not kept pace, not because we have not advocate for those resources, but quite frankly, the rate of growth is, is um, is beyond what we, we have the resources. So we continue to do that. One of the things that's important for everyone to understand is that our model at the elementary level is that our uh, language multilingual learners uh, attend their home school. And that's important because they're in their uh, communities and they are able to access resources after school, resources and resources right there in their home community. One of the things that happens at our secondary uh, level, and we are in the process of, of um, shifting, um, we have an old model at the secondary level and grades 6 to 12 for English learners who are only at proficiency levels 1 and 2. They go to a center model. That center model perhaps served us very well decades ago. It is no longer serving our students well, as our data indicates. Um, and it's not uh, functional for the volume of students that we have. So we have been uh, meeting with schools because many of our uh, English learner families have been waiving services because they want to be in their home school community so that they can participate in athletics and some of the other resources that also supports their social development of language. Uh, and so we are in the process of, of working to reallocate resources uh, and to support those families. But you uh, will see that that is an ongoing need and I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> I'm very passionate about it um, as we move forward into the budget process. So. I'll pull myself together now. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Dominowski. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions or comments? Ms. Roja? I mean, you. Ms. Hassan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for mentioning English language learners. Um, those I, I did have the opportunity to visit Lansdowne Middle School, which has a very strong um, ESOL program and EL, like English language learner um, student population. And I think one of the biggest things that I learned there was that the priority isn't necessarily increasing MAP scores there. It's making sure that those students are developing with their peers, that they are in, um, you know, in social environments, making sure that they are on track to learn English and be proficient in it as well as learn their own curriculum. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, but I did, I definitely did want to ask about um, how students and families and um, schools received data on MAP. So I know that, um, I know when I was in elementary school, um, I got the little, like, this was your score. Um, so I just, I just wanted to ask if, um, if we have data that goes in depth as to um, the specific um, areas in which students need to improve on. I know um, in some national things, I know the um, College Board has specific, you know, this is what students need to work on, this is what students are lacking. I'm just wondering, um, you know, if that's something that MAP also has um, and whether or not we can provide that to our school communities and our um, parents and students. 
Absolutely, great question. So our schools do receive reports um, for their overall um, school data, but they also are able to look at that um, by student and parents receive letters. And as you indicate, students, nothing's more powerful than putting data in the hands of students. Um, and with that information, our teachers are able and our school administrators are able to identify what are the areas that we really need to focus in. And again, I, I cannot stress enough that this is one of many measures, right? So we don't just take one measure and say, oh, well, that's the only thing we need to do. We're looking at this uh, data around a student and their, their starting point. We're also looking at how they're doing on unit assessments. We're looking at how they're doing on everyday um, activities within the classroom um, and identifying what are those areas that we need to focus in on, on for groups of students, uh, on training for teachers. And so it really yields sort of multiple action points. Uh, there are, um, I think there are resources also for parents on the um, uh, NWEA website as well to help parents make uh, meaning of the reports that they get. Other comments? Ms. Harvey? Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I think, uh, one, I appreciate the con giving us the context of the data because sometimes it can be overwhelming for us to receive mm -hmm. data of this sort uh, because we all are here to improve uh, the performance of our students and our school system and make sure that we're operating as a community. So I, I want to know, I think we all are clear that the pandemic created learning loss mm -hmm. amongst our student population. What are some of the strategies that are being implemented to close that gap across the different types of student services um, within the school system? And how can parents expect to see that and see the results of that? That is the question. <laughs> So thank you. You know, fundamentally, what's really important, and I, I will cite the research that um, we drew upon during the, the upheaval of the last couple years with the pandemic, and that we continue to draw on as a profession, um, is the importance of accelerating and learning, learning. And what we mean by that is it's, it's very tempting to not expose students to grade level standards as they're moving forward. It's very tempting to just say, you have to stay here until you're 100% proficient. What research shows us, and this really draws out of the um, New Orleans public school systems after Katrina, right? Because they were uh, a huge school system that really went through a tremendous disruption when the rest of the nation wasn't. And it yielded a great opportunity to understand how do you get students uh, recovered and moving forward as rapidly as possible. Uh, and what's important is that you continue to expose students to grade level standards on schedule and that you have adept um, in, um, responsive teaching. I don't want to use the word intervention because really this is quality teaching that should be happening happening all the time, not just in response to, to a crisis interruption. Uh, but it really comes down to data-informed decisions at the classroom level every day. Easy to say, not easy to do. That's why it's really important for our teachers to have the opportunity to collaborate with, the, with their peers. So if Ms. Kearns and I are teaching second grade together, it's, it's really best if we are looking at data together and, and informing one another and strategizing together what resources to pull um, to, to drive home the just-in-time um, teaching method or teaching need, if you will, for content knowledge and skills uh, for students as they're demonstrating it in real time. So that's one, that's like our key lever. Now, how do parents know? Uh, again, there is nothing more essential than parents and teachers having frequent conversation. Parents do have access to Schoology, and of course, that's our platform whereby teachers, I mean, excuse me, parents can go in and see how their students are doing. They can see the resources their, their students are work, working on, and they can communicate with their teacher. There is, you know, there's, there are some things we can never innovate, and a 
a great conversation between a teacher and a parent is something that we're never going to be able to innovate that, right? Because that's meaningful dialogue uh, where a parent and a teacher can look at a student work sample and say, this is how your student's doing. This is, a, this is what the standard looks like. These are the specific areas that we need to partner together to provide uh, reinforcement and extra support. Schools do have uh, resources to provide tutoring services right now uh, through grant funds, which we are very grateful to be able to offer. And for our students who are in community schools, those community schools are in the process, um, some of them are a little further along, of identifying all the needs uh, that they can provide for wraparound services um, beyond the school day. And there are lots of resources that may be uniquely available at those schools as well. Just one follow-up. Uh, is it posted on how parents can access the tutoring services? Do they need to go to the school specifically? Is there a request to be made online? How does that work? Yeah, uh, again, I would say reach out directly to your classroom teacher because the classroom teachers will know what the design of the tutoring at their particular school is. Our school administrators were empowered uh, to really design a tutoring uh, model, if you will, like for example, is it Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, Tuesdays through Thursdays or, you know, most people don't want to tutor on Fridays, but, um, you know, school administrators were really empowered to leverage the expertise that they're building and to understand what would work best for their communities. Uh, so I don't have a single bullet answer for that, but as always, your classroom teacher is your first source of um, real information about what's available in your school. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Domanowski. Just a quick follow up on that one. Um, you mentioned grant funding for some of these programs. Where are these grants coming from? And is this something that if the when the grant runs out and what happens next? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, you just have great questions. I could talk to you all night long. I think I will. Um, so the, many of the grants that we're currently leveraging are federal grants that have come as a function of helping school systems in this time of upheaval and this time as we move away, right, as we begin to level, level out and normalize. You're right, as is the case with all grants, sooner or later they do sunset. That's where it becomes in incumbent upon us to think about what is sustainability. Uh, you, uh, well, you may not, but my team often here hears me talk about what's our sustainability plan. I often sound like MPT uh, because we need sustainable funding for these things. But that's where it's really important, the community schools program. Another thing that's a, a gift of the blueprint legislation coming is additional resources for the concentration in poverty. Um, and so we look forward to how, as many of these federal grants for the crisis are sunsetting, the blueprint funding is beginning to ramp up. And we're going to have to be very thoughtful to make sure that we are splicing them together so that we do our best to provide uninterrupted services for our students. And then one more. Um, for Appendix A, I'm just wondering, um, how was this data, um, how did you get this data? So that is um, information that's, um, or I'll have to, uh, Forgive me for stuttering. <laughs> Our Department of Research and Accountability works, uh, gets the data from the MAP organization, and so then they compile the reports based on that data. It's just um, you have, it's, it's, it's um, percentage of students scoring by gender, and there's two genders up until grade three, and then there's three genders after that, so I'm just wondering why the change is from two to three. I will have to find out. It, it may be that that's what the NWAA form offers students to identify as. Uh, oh, just one quick, sorry. Um, just I'm ask, asking as a parent because I have a fourth grader, and I did ask him if he knew what non-binary means or if he'd ever heard it, and he said no. So I'm wondering if these students are asked this before they fill it out and who answers that question for them. Great question. Dr. Yarbrough, did you want to add something a couple Sorry, minutes ago? No, 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 no. No worries. Um, sure. The only other piece I was going to add was around the data um, in response to your question. Um, so as uh, Dr. Boswell McCombs talked about, she talked about the accelerating learning, but looking at accelerating in a different way. The other piece that we added as a result of the pandemic was that increased access to data and the increased training of our leaders 
to analyze data on a regular basis. So uh, before the pandemic, there was um, a lot of access to lagging data after those groups of students that have already performed, whether you're talking about at the quarter mark and there's a grade on the report card, or you're talking about at the end of the year when a state assessment comes in. Um, during that time of the pandemic, we were able to procure with the support of the board additional resources, performance matters being one, um, a full battery of Microsoft, which allowed us to move into uh, Power BI and rebuild a performance dashboard. What that means is that there's right at the um, principal's fingertips, and, and our guide was three clicks or less, that you can take a snapshot, it's color coded, take a quick look as a leadership team, and you see how your students are performing at that moment of time. Why that's important is because it allows you to ask more questions. If you see red and orange are the colors which are associated associated with D's and E's, you want to dig a little deeper. What department is that? It's English. I'm going to click on that. And this is available from fourth grade to twelfth grade. You click on English, you can dig a little deeper. What class are we talking about? You see that it's one specific subject, dig a little deeper. You're looking at the PLC or the professional learning community. All the teachers that teach the subject to identify is this you know, only in one set of teachers' classes, or is this across the grade level? When it's across the grade level, then you're gonna go look at the assessment, you're gonna look at the questions, and that's where Dr. Boswell Muscomis and her team comes in. Are many of our students across the district having difficulty on these particular concepts? What is it that we wanna put in real time for the teachers as they go back into the classroom to reinforce the subject because many subjects are recursive, particularly if we're talking about English or math that's foundational that builds on another, or are we looking at something long-term for, for our summer work uh, for our system? So I thought that was important context to add that when we're looking at the data, we're not looking at the data in isolation. We're looking at both leading and lagging data what is it that we need to fix at the school level? And then what is it that we need to do to support that work at the central office level? You're welcome. Any other questions or Mrs. Hassan? Sorry, last question. Um, I just wanted to ask, so I know we talk a lot about learning loss after the pandemic. I just wanted to ask the importance of acknowledging the learning skills loss. So that comes with attention span, which is something that I know a lot of students experience, um, and a lot of testing skills um, that may cause a lot of this gap in data from previous years. So I just wanted to ask maybe how, we're, how we are um, taking that into consideration and into effect as we are analyzing this new data. So I, I would say, if, if I want to make sure I understand your question. How are we helping students adjust back to like normal test taking and con, like all those uh, sort of internal disciplines? To, okay, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So that is part of our everyday normalizing school, right? So one of the things that's been um, fantastic this year, we're very excited about, of course, is, and I don't want to jinx this, you know, we've opened the school year with largely no interruptions. Um, and may that persist throughout the rest of the school year. Um, and so just getting students back to, to school every day, uh, the duration of a, a school day, and building that stamina, we do routinely teach students throughout the, the years how to study for tests, how to prepare for tests, get a good night's sleep the night before. These are things that we did before the interruptions of the last couple years. We know that our students experience a great deal of turbulence and, and conduct and behavior and all those sort of like postures that uh, we need to hold to do well academically. We're renormalizing and getting those things back in place. But um, absolutely, we know it was a huge disruption in all facets of our lives. Mm. Anyone else? I just want to remind the board that we use MAP and um, we can go back to those presentations last year where our principals, I won't put Principal Kearns on the spot, but the, the schools use that data to actually look at how they're going to continue to support students instructionally. So as those reports are going home, there are some recommendations on those reports, but the school will actually regroup students, look at additional courses. We have reading specialists. Some schools have math specialists. We're working on that to really provide that additional support. So the data will then inform the instruction. And there are times where principals will regroup, regroup students, put them in different classrooms, provide that additional support. So families, when we reach out and say there are opportunities at the school, 
um, when there are opportunities as a system, uh, we encourage our families to take advantage of those opportunities because we're pride, providing, we open up those doors for access and opportunity, but it really, as we articulated last year, what really happens at a school to really program or provide additional supports. And as Dr. Boswell McCombs, we are looking at rigor. And so the, the data is being used to not only fill in gaps, but also to continue to push our students to advanced level courses. So I wanna thank the team um, for actually presenting tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so now the next item on the agenda is the report on first quarter results and for that, Calling on Dr. McComas, I'm not sure about Dr. Zarchin, and then Principal Kearns. So. Yes, so um, welcome back. <laughs> Uh, I am Mary McComas. I have the pleasure of serving as our Chief Academic Officer. I am joined by Principal Kearns, yes. and I believe Dr. Zarchin is joining us um, virtually. But yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. Um, so we're here this evening to share with you how our students are performing for first marking period. Um, and so if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, as I was saying just momentarily ago, we are so pleased that we had a successful and traditional opening to this academic year um, and that it did go largely uninterrupted, which has empowered us to, to sink back in and really focus on teaching and learning and establishing safe and uh, supportive school environments. Next slide, please. As Team BCPS, we want to know how our students are performing and if we are making progress. This evening, we will focus on three notable indicators of student success, attendance, student belonging, and course performance, discussing how our students are progressing and how we are responding systematically in each school level community. As always, we will showcase how a school brings our efforts to life for their students. Next slide, please. As a community, as we've already demonstrated this evening, we are committed to monitoring and discussing in open session student performance so that we can make data-informed decisions on behalf of our students and young people. We recognize and it's important to, to maintain the mindset that data is a flashlight to help us expand our vision and gain a deeper understanding of what our student needs are in their unique context. Next slide, please. Our strategic plan, the COMPASS, is clear on our purpose. We will increase achievement for all students while preparing a variety of pathways for college and career readiness in a safe, orderly, and caring environment. Throughout this evening's presentation, we will highlight system improvement team efforts along with school level specific actions to support student success. Next slide, please. This evening's uh, presentation, as we discuss, um, includes attendance, belonging um, outcomes, and highlighting a school story. These do fall within our two focus areas of our compass, learning accountability and safe and supportive school environments. Next slide, please. The research is clear. When students improve their attendance rates, they improve their academic prospects and chances for graduating. First, we will look at our attendance data for the first marking period and speak to how we are responding to our students' attendance. Next slide, please. On the slide before you, you will find our first marking period attendance by grade span. Promoting high attendance rates for all our students is an important part of our growth and achievement over time. The National Center for Education Statistics notes that students who attend school regularly have been shown to achieve at higher levels than students who do not have regular attendance. And in fact, by ninth grade, student attendance is a stronger predictor of graduation rate than eighth grade test scores. And therefore, the homeschool partnership is critical in supporting our student attendance across all the grades. As you can see, we are approaching our attendance goals. However, we do have room to improve and are working on that. At this point, I'll ask Dr. Zarchin to speak to some of the actions that we do at the school level to help our students with attendance. In our schools, school attendance teams monitor and identify actions as needed. 
Actions include proactive strategies as well as interventions. Interventions often begin with calls home to parents and caregivers to understand what are the challenges they are facing in helping their students attend school regularly. Overall, we recognize student engagement both in classroom and in extracurricular opportunities as important to ensuring students are well connected to schools in meaningful ways. Next slide, please. Throughout this presentation, I will also highlight data from our virtual learning program, often referred to as the VLP. The VLP is in its second year and currently serves approximately 1,821 students uh, in BCPS. 1,091 of those students are full-time uh, VLP students and we serve 730 students part-time. Students are considered present in their virtual learning classes if they log into their synchronous Google Class Meet session with their teachers. As seen on the screen, our VLP attendance for middle grade students does exceed our system goal, and we're very proud of that effort this year. VLP faculty administration follow all of the same approaches to both proactive and intervention supports as our traditional uh, schools do. Next slide, please. This chart displays our rates of first uh, marking period chronic absenteeism by grade span. A student is considered chronically absent when their attendance rate reaches or falls below 90%. This includes both excused and unexcused absences. Chronic absenteeism for a student is a very serious matter and can be a function of a variety of root causes. This is where uh, the importance um, of our work of school teams comes into action in working with um, parents to understand what are the barriers that are uh, causing the chronic absenteeism. At this point, I'll also invite Dr. Zarchin to speak to what uh, schools do to address this. So in this part of the presentation, we'll examine to what extent our students have a sense of belonging with the school community and why does it matter? Annually, uh Dr. Zarchin, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I think you, you've moved ahead. We're in chronic absenteeism. Okay, I apologize for that. I can't see the slides from, from this perspective. Sorry. So school level actions, it's important to note that multi-tiered systems of support are in place to address student engagement and attendance at the schoolhouse. As mentioned earlier, student attendance teams monitor students struggling with regular attendance and partner with parents and caregivers to improve student attendance. These supports increase in intensity, leveraging the PPW up to and including court action when appropriate. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back one. The chart displays rates of first uh, marking period chronic absenteeism by grade span for students in our virtual learning program. Again, a student is considered chronically absent when their attendance falls below 90%, the same for virtual learning as for in-person instruction. When compared to the system-wide uh, data rates uh, for all BCPS students, it is noted that the chronic absenteeism rates for all levels of ELP were lower in comparison. Next slide, please. So now, in this part <laughs> of our presentation, we will examine the extent to which our students have a sense of belonging within the school community and why it matters. Annually, BCPS conducts a stakeholder climate survey, which provides us with insight into student, staff, and community perceptions of climate. Last year, 57,986 people participated in the survey. Of those 50,000 plus people, there were 43,500 students, 7,800 parents and caregivers, 5,400 staff members, and 1,100 central team members. The BCPS Stakeholder Climate Survey was accessible in 18 languages with approximately 1,600 translated responses. The responses or results of the school climate survey are publicly available on our BCPS website as a dashboard item and a key report. Next slide, please. So how do we measure student belonging? Annually, as Dr. Zarchin mentioned, we conduct our stakeholder survey, which provides us insights into our student, staff, and community perceptions of climate. 
our student belonging domain measures the extent to which our students feel physically and emotionally safe at school. Items in this domain address the overall school environment and peer-to-peer -peer relations. So what is it our students are telling us in this survey? As evident on the screen, while we have on average, more than most students are indicating a sense of belonging, we must continue in our efforts. And this is important because it's uh, directly related to attendance and engagement. I'll invite, um, uh, one of the things I want to mention is that we do have a system improvement team on family engagement, which is just one example of a system level team where we're working uh, to uh, engage families to elevate student belonging and, and uh, student attendance as well. I'll invite Dr. Zarchin uh, to add. Thank you. So you may be asking, why does this matter? Research is clear and indicates that a strong sense of belonging translates to students of all ages and developmental stages improving academically, being more engaged and motivated in school, and increasing their physical and emotional health. Next, we'll speak to how we strive to support our students' sense of belonging. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as we know, we are striving to engage over 111,000 students to develop a strong sense of belonging. And at the system level, we offer many robust academic pathways to engage our students in relevant learning experiences that will support their college and ultimately their career readiness. For example, we offer 37 distinct programs of study for students in CTE with over 40 pathways. Um, often referred to as our CTE pathways or clusters. We also offer 116 magnet programs across 32 schools, serving 19,995 students this year alone. In addition, we offer opportunities for students to engage in uh, experiences such as mock trial. We annually have about 300 students in mock trial and another 300 students who engage in Model UN. We also offer many career-oriented clubs such as robotics. We have 500 students annually who participate in that. Future Business Leaders of America, that's about 1,200 students. We also offer uh, Skills USA for students in CTE programs, uh, the DECA program for uh, business and marketing um, students, future healthcare uh, health professionals in HOSA, and future farmers of America, Society of Women Engineers, and my personal favorite, Educators Rising. Uh, Dr. Zarchin, if you could share with everyone some of the offerings we have at the school in terms of extracurriculars and athletics. Thank you. So across our schools, we offer a wide range of extracurriculars based on student interest, such as robotics, theater, band, orchestra, and chorus. As you know, we have a robot, robust athletics program at both the middle and high school levels, in addition to our allied sports programs for students with special needs. During the 2021 to 2022 school year, approximately 11,000 student athletes participated in the high school interscholastic athletics program. Approximately 3,000 students in grades six, seven, and eight participated in our middle school interscholastic athletics program. We know the more a student is positively engaged in their school community, the more likely they will be to survive, survive, thrive, and be engaged socially, emotionally, and academically. Next slide, please. We will review how our students are performing in coursework holistically within ELA, math, science, and social studies. Next slide, please. Um, the elementary first marking period course grade distribution chart is displayed um, on your left, and the second chart to your right displays the percentage of students earning grades of C or better. These data are shown for students in grades four and five for the core content areas of English, language arts, mathematics, science, and social studies. Overall, in all subject areas, more than 96% of our elementary students earned a passing grade um, during first marking period. Rates of students earning a letter grade of D or E were highest in mathematics and lowest in science. And over 90% of science and social studies students earned a grade of C or, C or better. Our rates of elementary students earning a C or better in English language arts and math were over 
At the system level, we have a system improvement team that's focused on uh, reading and, and how to uh, drive our reading um, achievement higher. At this point, I'll invite Dr. Zarchin to add about school level actions. Thank you. At the school level, teams are engaged in collaborative planning and work together to support individual students based on need. Those teams take different forms and shapes involving staff, students, and stakeholders. Next slide, please. This slide, where we are looking at middle school first marking period grades. Uh, again, on your left, you'll see the letter distribution. On the right, you'll see uh, the breakout by content areas. The middle school course grade distribution percentage of students earning C's or better are displayed. Approximately 80% of all middle school students earned a C or higher in subject areas of English language arts, science, and social studies. Approximately a quarter of our middle school students earned a first marking period grade of A in mathematics, and nearly a third earned an A in English language arts, science, social studies. Um, again, at the system level, we have system improvement teams who identify actionable steps to address the key metrics in our compass. One such example um, is the system improvement team on Algebra 1 by grade 8. And Dr. Zarchin? Yes, another example of how teams are coming together is our re responsive middle schools who are committed to ensuring equity and action in all middle schools. They're working to develop and implement consistent expectations for a responsive middle school through AMLE research. They're also working to develop and implement a consistent format for supervisory visits, identify clear measures for mutual accountability, and implement a structure for building principal leadership capacity. Next slide, please. And again, here we are looking at our high school uh, marking period um, performance. The high school course grade distribution chart and percentage of students earning C's or better are displayed. Over 70% of high school students earned a C or better in English language arts, science, and social studies courses. And over two thirds of our high school students achieved this benchmark in mathematics courses. Approximately 30% of our high school students earned a first marking period of A in English language arts, science, and social studies courses. A system improvement team um, that influence our high school work uh, is a system improvement team on college and career readiness and graduation rate. College and another on college and career readiness and our uh, CTE programs. And then another on athletic eligibility. And Dr. Zarchin, if you, I invite you to add anything. Yes, yeah, so as Dr. Yarborough mentioned earlier, the addition of performance matters being used across schools has really been a game changer and has placed real-time data in the hands of our school leaders and classroom teachers to make data-informed instructional decisions. Next slide, please. Here we are looking at our virtual learning program. Uh, achieve, uh, grades for um, first marking period. In general, course performance has improved across the three levels of the VLP when compared to last year. Uh, this will be more evident in the next slides, but overall in the middle school program, uh, less than 4% of our students earned an E in social studies and more than 42% earned a grade of A. In the high school program, more than 86% of our students earned a passing grade of A. Uh, uh, passing grade of D or higher in mathematics with more than 70% earning a grade of C or higher. Next slide, please. In all levels of the virtual learning program, there are noted improvements in students receiving a grade of C or higher across every level when compared to last year. In both the middle and high school levels of VLP, every subject area showed significant improvement when, when compared to the previous year. Over 90% of our middle school VLP students received a grade of C or better in social studies, and 83% earned a grade of C or better in science. In the high school VLP, is noted that the rate of students who receive grades of C or better exceeds a system-wide rate of students earning a grade of C or better in all subject areas. Next slide, please. As is our practice, we are pleased to showcase a school that is deeply engaged in the work of student achievement and belonging. I would now like to turn things over to Ms. Kearns, proud principal of Hollabird Middle School. Next slide, please. Good evening, everyone. Yes, I am Melanie Kearns, the very <laughs> proud principal of Hollywood STEM Middle School, uh, which is located in the southeast side of Baltimore County in the great neighborhood of Dundalk. 
Our focus is on moving the needle now that we have demonstrated growth in climate and culture and that sense of belonging among students and staff. The tools for this include school-wide AVID strategies, CER or claims evidence reasoning strategies, and the use of resource teachers through our Title I program narrative. The proof of these efforts is witnessed in students internalizing and applying said strategies in all classes from grade four to eight. We are the only school who can attend to the impact of this continuity and high level of expectations from upper elementary through middle school. Our Code of Conduct and SPP jointly emphasize the importance of behavior and academics. Next slide, please. As we continue to grow and improve, our core beliefs keep us anchored to efforts that increase the sense of belonging for all. One way we do this is by maintaining a welcoming schoolhouse. This is the physical presence of bright, student-centered hallways and classrooms, as well as adults who are present and involved. We ensure all teachers are part of a PLC in order to increase their effectiveness, and we maintain our three Ps, planning, pacing, and purpose, as well as being a part of a committee to solidify their buy-in to the overall success of Hollibird. We support teachers through classroom challenges by being present and positive. We are intentional in our support to our students beyond the curriculum by utilizing PBIS, MTSS, and SEL strategies. We focus on the basic needs in order to make space for academics. As all educators know, we must meet those fundamental needs and respond accordingly before we can expect our students to perform in the classroom. This was key prior to the pandemic, but has become increasingly more evident as students and families and staff continue to thirst for normalcy. Our recent designation as a community school for the 22-23 school year has increased our ability to engage members of the greater Dundalk community. Our main goal is parent engagement, which we keep at the root of all plans. Our first community school event this year was Bingo, which brought together over 150 people, as well as featured donations from local merchants and schools. Thank you very much for your time this evening, and next slide, please. Thank you, Principal Kearns. I want to uh, share appreciation for your presentation tonight, but most importantly, for what you do to support your students and staff every day. Uh, posted as a schedule of past and future academic reports, uh, we greatly appreciate this time and opportunity to present tonight. Thank you to all three of you who have made that presentation for us. Are there any questions at this time? Mr. McMillian. Thank you very much for the presentation. Principal Kearns, I love it when a principal sits in on one of these presentations because you're boots on the ground, you're on the front lines. It's different when people talk about things and they don't have that experience with them. I want to go to slide 22, uh, 21. I think this is an excellent opportunity. If I'm not mistaken, and you correct me, okay. out of 170 school, 76 schools in Baltimore County, you're the only, it says Hollibird Elementary slash Middle School. You're the only elementary slash middle school in Baltimore County. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And you have the fourth and fifth grades that, that normally was across the street at Norwood. Now they're into your building. Is that correct? Yes, that is partially correct in okay. terms of the original designation of fourth and fifth grade goes all the way back about 10 years ago to the closure of Eastwood, which um, previously sat where the current Precinct 12 sits. And I know you do an excellent job of keeping those fourth and fifth graders away from the middle school. However, there must be times where they, they share a space. Is that correct? So I'm going to refer to them as my littlest eagles, first of all. My fourth and fifth graders are my littlest eagles. And so we do maintain two bell schedules so that when they transition to shared spaces such as a cafeteria or a gym, it is during the time in which my middle schoolers are not transitioning. But we also do look for the positive and find ways to bring them together for very influential and mentorship opportunities. It is There's nothing um, more impactful than watching an eighth grader help two fourth graders mediate something. 
it is, and again, I'm the only one that can attest to that right there in that building. Um, so yes, the, we do have a structured bell schedule to keep that flow, um, but we also look for the opportunities to have it be a positive. And, and I know that this is off of the academic performance piece, but I saw the opportunity to share this with the county, because a lot of people don't realize that you're the only one that does that. Yes, and then my last comment, if I'm not mistaken, and I can't give you the exact wording of it, but I think the SAGE report and the multi-year improvement plan for all schools schools, both of them talk about looking at this situation. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Hager, did you have a question? Um, yes, I did. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the presentation. I am sorry for not being there in person to see all your faces. Um, I had some questions about the VLP. Um, first of all, when will we be making a decision about whether or not to continue the VLP past this trial period? So we, thank you for the question. We are actively in that process now. You know, it's important to uh, make decisions far enough in advance to, to provide families and faculty uh, clear understanding and expectation about what resources will be available for them for next year. So we're actively in that process and should be um, wrapping that up within the next month. Okay, great. And um, as far as attendance in a in the VLP, as someone who often teaches in hybrid settings and things like that, um, attendance and engagement can be challenging. Do the children are they required to have their videos on in the VLP? So we do work to have them on if there is a reason that a student. Um, oh, thank you, Dr. Elmendorf. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Elmendorf, who helps oversee the VLP. I was kind of hoping you'd be here tonight, Dr. Hager. I'm seeing you. <laughs> um, thank you for the great question. And um, last year, we really adopted the idea of what we had during emergency remote learning, which was um, we weren't necessarily um, strongly encouraging students to have their their cameras on for various reasons. But this year, after reflecting and talking to VLP families and our students. Um, we're actually strongly encouraging our students to have their camera on and we actually said to them if you're going to stay in the VLP this coming year the research shows the anecdotal evidence shows that it's your, your students going to do better if their cameras on for the most part so our teachers have been deliberate though in times where students are working independently or they're working in a small group they don't necessarily have to have their their cameras on but there's there's way more um, opportunities and expectation as it relates to students having their cameras on so that there's more engagement because that's one of the things we saw last year that the engagement wasn't where we wanted it to be. And when the students have their cameras on, the engagement's much higher, so. Yeah, certainly, I mean, to avoiding the, know, having the kids log in and then go about their business, you know, in their house and, and not really uh, learning, so so that that's good news. Um, and similarly, for when tests are administered, um, I know that, I recall when my daughter took an AP test during the pandemic, the, there were a lot of rules around you know, having the video on and things like that. Are, are, this, are there similar rules for testing in the VLP? That's another great question, and that's something that we spent considerable time this summer uh, reflecting upon our practices from last year. And um, what we want to make sure we're doing is looking at our end of unit assessments and our CBAs and different things and making sure that we're able to make really genuine comparisons between and among the levels in the VLP, but also with our, our brick and mortar schools. And so we're making those um, testing environments as authentic as possible. Um, Generally, the students have their cameras on and their microphones off, and so um, we have worked with various offices to make sure that we're coming up with a process that really um, makes the, the test-taking environment as close to one that is really um, able to be monitored in a physical environment, uh, replicating that in a, in a virtual environment. And we're, we're still looking to, to find ways and perhaps even technologies that we might be able to use to ensure that students are are genuinely um, giving their own answers in ways that are, are authentically showing what they know. Great, yeah, I can imagine, um, not that any of our children would do this, but cheating and things like that could uh, could certainly increase um, right. in, in a setting like that. So um, thank you for, for your responses, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amador. Other questions? Ms. Ms. Pumphrey? I have more of a statement, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. I would just like to go back to Principal Kearns and thank you again for um, showcasing the success of Hollabird. Um, I'd like to point out that and when you started your presentation, you spoke about um, encouraging a sense of belonging at your school. And looking at the slide, when you look at the percentage of student, students feeling you know, that they a uh, sense of belonging in their school, it drops significantly from elementary to middle school and then rises again in high school. 
And then if you refer back to suspension rates, suspension rates increase dramatically in middle school and then decrease again in high school. Um, and I think that sense of belonging um, sort of fosters that. So it's encouraging that you to see that you also realize that the importance of that community and belonging and that, that students feel um, in school. Thank, Thank you. you, I appreciate that. Also, just going back to that same one about the belonging, um, the stakeholder survey that goes out, is there a copy of that questionnaire that goes out? And do you know if on that questionnaire they asked um, the stakeholders if there was any, like a comment uh, or a question where, um, what could BCPS do to make you feel more belonging? What are, do you have any suggestions? Sure, so I'll, do we, Oh, I have I have a colleague here who, from the Department of Research who could address that question more thoroughly than I could. Well, I can respond to that, um, oh, okay. Ms. Dominikowski. So the the schools get their individual results, and then what they do from that, they go beyond the results to figure out how to address the belonging. So it is one of those uh, assessments, and Mr. Connolly can give the appropriate term, but then we ask our schools to go back and a part of the school progress plan is around climate and a lot of that is dealing with how do they look at addressing those concerns about, we want our middle school students, I'm going to go back to what Ms. Pumphrey said, we want our, we notice the same data and as Dr. Zartan talked about the responsive middle school summit that we did last year, we brought all our middle school principals and we talked about how do we improve that transition from elementary to middle because we were seeing the same thing. What can we do so we don't see a gap, we don't see a drop? But the principals would, will go beyond the data to drill down and look at is there a particular grade, what do we do with our or student orientation to make sure our students feel welcome, and then how we continue to transfer that from seventh grade to eighth grade. But absolutely, that was a big discussion around our responsive middle school summit. But Mr. Conley, anything you want to add about the survey? Uh, it was mentioned earlier, but <clears throat> it is available online at bcps.org. We have a dashboard that goes through each of the domains and questions that were asked and responses, as well as a static report that's in key reports that goes into extensive detail. Uh, the survey itself does not have open-ended um, questions, uh, just due to the nature of the type of survey and the amount of people that we're surveying. Um, but it does exactly what Dr. Williams shared, which is gives you insight into where you want to go with um, looking at your own school and stakeholder feedback. So that information um, doves nicely into the school progress planning work that happens in schools as we transition from one school year to the next where we look at what we put in place as intentional work for school performance or school progress and then what are the uh, feedback that we're receiving from our constituents and then from there building into now what do we want to know more about asking those really meaningful questions to dig deeper into what's working and what's not working. I guess I'm, I'm trying to be more specific as instead of just looking at this data and them telling you that they're uncomfortable not feeling belonging, is there any thought into making a survey where it's specifically asking students or us um, bringing in a, you know, just a discussion group of a couple of kids and asking them what it is that makes them feel like they don't belong and it, what can BCPS do to help them instead of us trying to figure it out for them, maybe we can listen to them and, and work together that way. And that is some of the work that happens in schoolhouses. And if I may add to that, thank you. Yeah, um, so in our example, if belonging was in question, then we would take a group of students and have students representing grade four all the way through grade eight and talk to us a little bit more about what does that mean. So let's break that question down in student language. What does it really mean to belong and what do you need from us? What can we expect from you? Um, and that's where you really get the work done in terms of what do the kids feel is needed in the schoolhouse. And from it is born something like an advisory group, um, additional counseling groups. Sometimes it's as simple as making sure every child has a teacher in that building or an adult in that building that they can go to. So that's how we would break it down at Hollabird. Right, and I was just hoping that that could be spread across all schools as so that every... So that is the work of all huh? schools, yes. so mm -hmm. let me just clarify that. Mm -hmm. When that data is given, that's the expectation to all principals, take your data and drill down further. We actually heard from our students that they wanted to know the data as well, and that's where we said invite stakeholder groups of students to come in during the summer, 
parents as well to drill down and say, let's look at our data, but what does that mean? So as Principal Kern, she gave an example, but that's an expectation mm -hmm. because it's a part of our school progress plan mm -hmm. to drill down and say, what does that look, what does it mean in our school? And what does it mean that in terms of our next steps in action? And day one, I've said, we want every student to have at least one adult in the building whom they trust. And what we're pushing more, and we have our student coordinator, um, to have more students involved and connected to school activities or feel that they are part of that school community. Mrs. Sun. I can speak to that as well from the student perspective and um, hopefully that adds a little bit of insight. But I think something that is essential is that students can and will say something about their sense of belonging and they will be very vocal about it even if it's not something that's necessarily aggregate data that we can analyze here on the board. Um, as a student, I know Every single student, every school that I've encountered has some sort of feedback policy, whether that means they have um, a principal's advisory council. I think I've visited so many schools with those amazing advisory councils. Um, students who are involved in extracurriculars have you know, taken it upon themselves to let their principal know that they feel a certain way about their school community. Even students who aren't necessarily involved in those extracurriculars can go to their teachers, can go to each other. And usually word spreads very, very fast, especially in, you know, in such an environment where you're surrounded by your peers, by people of similar ages. So um, I'm very fortunate to you know, work with a group of students, about 40 students within my cabinet and empower them to really foster that sense of belonging within their schools and ensure that, you know, we're thinking about perspectives that aren't just with the most vocal students. So um, I know Holliver, I did visit Holliver Middle School and they do a very good job about communicating what they feel should be better in their schools, but it's also something that if we listen to our students, they are already communicating these things. So a huge shout out to our principals who are in the hallways speaking to our students and encouraging them to really speak up because we don't necessarily need a survey or some sort of extra data point to prove that our, our students you know, are, are experiencing a certain experience, but it's really just listening to them because I, I promise you they have some ideas, solutions, all of which, and as soon as we begin to empower them, we begin to really form our solutions for a lot of these issues. Thank you. I have um, three points I'd like to make. First, thank you, Principal Kearns. I know that this is um, not easy, but um, thank you for your perspective. And also thank you for the hard work you've done as leader at Apollo Bird. I know that you've worked so hard on improving the climate and the culture of that school. Um, so it's not easy work, so thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate um, that. You're welcome. The second point is um, the VLP. I'm so encouraged to see the gains and the improvement that the VLP program has made. I'm just looking forward to hearing what our next steps and how we can utilize that program to meet the needs of some of our students. So kudos, um, Dr. Almendorf, to your group for the work that they did. I know that was a rough start last year, um, so it's really encouraging to see the data points that are pointing in the right direction. Um, the other piece is, and um, this is more of a systemic comment, not a school-based comment, because I know some of this is already happening at the school level, but how are we correlating the data points that we that you just presented for quarter one data with the MAP report? So we had that to look at, as well as looking at what you just provided, um, because the results in the presentations are very different. We saw a high percentage, um, not high enough, but a good percentage of kids getting passing grades, and yet when we look at our MAP results, our kids are, um, it's vastly different. We don't have kids that are performing at that 61st percentile. So those two data points are, are telling me two different things. When we look at the belonging data that you went over, and I looked at the high school particularly, I'm not seeing subgaps. I don't see, I see it was pretty consistent from student group to student group. Yet, Yet, when we look at the map results, we have huge subgroup um, d um, gaps. So that, to me, is also not kind of jiving. We have a third of our high school kids who are chronically absent. So as a system, more I know that schools are doing this individually, but as a system, are we looking to correlate those multiple data points that we know we can't just look at one, but are we correlating those multiple data points to really dig deep to find out what is going on to make sure that we are putting the right shifts, the right strategies in place, and especially as we start our budget process. We're gonna have hard decisions to make as we enter January and we do this budget process, and the decisions we 
make have to reflect what the needs are and the solutions. So as a system, at the system level, was that for me? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. So I'm not looking for an answer. I wasn't looking for an answer um, because it's too many questions at once. But that correlation of data, that deeper dive, especially as we enter the budget system, um, feels so necessary at this point because we're getting a lots of different um, data points pointing to, to different outcomes. That three minutes goes fast, or was it only <laughs> two? Okay, any other questions from anybody who's got minutes left? Nope? Okay. I, I do want to, again, thank the team and Mr. McMillian. I want to thank you because we started to include a perspective of a school. We thought it was important for the board to hear a perspective of a school and having our principal to speak about the work. Clearly, it's the leadership of the school in addition to the leadership and the work of the, every classroom teacher, paraeducator, counselor, those who are touching our students in the classroom. So I want to thank, again, our team. But more importantly, I want to thank our principal, Kearns, for being part of this presentation. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you again. The next item on the agenda is an informational items, is informational items including the financial report for October 2022 and the annual MBE slash SBE report for the 2021 to 2022 school year and the revised superintendent's rules for 3250 and 7110. The next item on the agenda is agenda setting, which is an opportunity for board members to suggest topics for future board meetings. Um, so we will begin, I'm going to go around. Next time I promise, Ms. Domenowski, I'll mix it up. But Ms. Domenowski, do you have any um, agenda items or final comments? Um, I just uh, wanted to say um, I'm deeply sorry that some of us uh, for some families out there that will not be celebrating the holidays with some of their loved ones. And I um, am thinking of all of you, and I'm thinking of um, our whole community right now, and I'm hoping we can all come together and have a wonderful vacation. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Nothing for, the, for agenda items, but just um, wanted to wish everybody a restful, peaceful, happy, and healthy holidays. Mr. McMillian? I think at some point we need to talk about athletic directors. Uh, some of you realize I taught school for 35 years. I was in an athletic leadership role for 25 years. There's too many of our schools that don't have athletic trainers. Uh, we service in high school and middle school athletic programs thousands of kids. And we don't have, just for example, if I'm not mistaken, in the high schools, out of 24 high schools, there's 14 that have athletic trainers. There's 10 that don't, if I'm not mistaken. And then all of our middle schools don't have them. Sometimes the high school athletic director, athletic trainer, athletic trainers, sometimes the trainer goes down into the middle school and helps. But we need to look at this. It's a safety issue. It's an equity issue. Uh, We've got too many people out there, too many young people out there in the, in the heat of the summer. And, and that was my biggest fear, was losing somebody at practice, in a football practice. Uh, and, that was, and, it, and I'm no longer in that role, and that's, I'm kind of glad of that. And one thing I want to say, too, is I'm kind of sad. I was in that, in that role for 25 years. When I try to talk to people about this topic, people say back to me, Rod, I can't talk to you. And, and it's like, that's, that's disturbing to me. Because I've, I, you're, not that I was close friends with these people, but I was acquaintances with them. And when I ask them to give me the status, give me an up-to-date thing on, the, on the, where we are with trainers, they, Rod, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. And, and that's disturbing to me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, Ms. Harvey? Uh, thank you. I do not have any agenda items today, but I would like to thank everyone for your continued participation in this process. If we are to improve education for our students and our families, it's going to take all of us. So thank you for your commitment. And I'd also like to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, happy New Year. However you choose to celebrate, please just celebrate. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. <laughs> um, Mrs. Sun. Thank you. So 
Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone is looking forward to a restful holiday break. I know I personally am. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our students who I've had the pleasure of meeting with over the past few weeks um, for their continued dedication to their own education, to empowering themselves and each other, and to speaking to me. I encourage all of you, hopefully in the new year, to go out and visit some schools. It truly is the best part of being on this dais in this role, um, because our, our students truly are power, and I, I cannot begin to thank them for the hard work and due diligence that they provide our county. And as I end every board meeting, I just wanted to remind you all to get in some good trouble. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Uh, I would like to see staff delve into the effectiveness of the implementation of the cell phone policy. Which, which was changed uh, about about two years ago, and see if uh, if there has been follow through. Because I have had concerns from uh, uh, from the uh, staff that uh, that they uh, that the policy and the superintendent's rule were not being uh, were not being uh, administered as uh, as hoped. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Savoy. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd just like to um, give you something to think about. I'd like to see uh, metal detectors installed in all of the high schools. I really believe that we're living in a dangerous time, and if we lose just one child, that's one too many. But think about that. And then I'd like to say, have a happy holiday to everybody, and God bless you, and I'll see you after the new year, into the new year. And then I would first, um, I see um, Dr. Ferguson sitting in the audience. Um, I had the pleasure, um, and I know um, Ms. Savoy did, Dr. Savoy did too, of attending the HBCU um, conference or workshop or convention, I don't know what you want to call it, um, at Newtown High School last weekend or two weekends ago. And it was, it was a wonderful event, the participation, the number of families, the number of staff. Um, it was just a great event. So please thank your um, staff for all the hard work. I'm sure that took a, you're probably planning next year's um, already. So thank you very much. I just want to wish everyone um, a, oh, whoops, I, Dr. Hager, I'm, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll get you one sec. I would like to wish everybody um, happy holidays and also for our staff and our students have a wonderful and restful um, week off and we'll see you in the new year. And last but not least, Dr. Hager, your final comments. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, um, I wanted to echo what Mr. Offerman said about the cell phone policy, and I also um, wanted to mention to our new board members that January is our budget month, and so get a lot of rest over the holiday break because it's a very, um, uh, very active time, and we'll certainly get to really have great insight of, on the priorities for the coming year, and I think that that process will really help to solidify uh, interest coming going forward for the board. And so um, I'm excited about that process and, uh, and looking forward to doing that with you all. And have a great holiday and a happy new year, that's all. Thank you. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be on Tuesday, January 10th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. A public hearing on the superintendent's proposed FY 2024 operating budget will be held on Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. 23 at 6 30 p.m. in the boardroom. I've already thanked everybody and had great wishes for the holiday and it is 8 56 and how many times Madam Vice Chair? Once? Meetings adjourned. <laughs>